everybody, how's it going? Today, let's take a detailed look at the 1957 Ford Thunderbird. And this is going to be a detailed, in-depth view of the Thunderbird. We'll start it up, show the engine, get an exhaust clip, and go over the performance data, and show you a bunch of the unique aspects of the interior, as well as exterior. And before we begin, I'd like to extend a big thanks and special shout out to Streetside Classic Cars located in Charlotte, North Carolina for allowing me to come out and film the very unique 1957 Ford Thunderbird Roadster. And so, without further ado, let's go and start her up, let her run. This original Thunderbird color is an iridescent color known as Thunderbird Bronze. Very unique and has a rose tint to it with the matching vinyl interior. Beautifully smooth. The 57 T-Bird is a pretty pivotal year in the fact that it was the last year of the two-seater Thunderbird until they were reintroduced in 2002. It was also pretty loaded for its day, with many optional features including power brakes, power steering, and your choice of two different transmissions. You can either get a two-speed Ford-O-Matic automatic gearbox or this three-speed manual. First gear, second, and third. All the way over and up is reverse. An elegantly designed steering wheel thin rim with grips on the back to keep a nice sure-footed feeling to it, as well as a high-polished chrome accent ring for the horn with the Thunderbird logo embedded in the middle. So we're going to flip on the headlamps. The windows are manual, but powered was an option. And we'll check out the exterior, shall we? Few automotive icons have done so much over the years to impact the very foundation, ideals, and images that people associate with owning a car. 1950s America was an exciting time of prosperity, optimism, and bold automotive design. That confidence and passion has led to some of the most iconic automobiles over the next 20 years. One of the most famous, the Ford Thunderbird, was one of the earliest examples of the quote-unquote personal luxury car concept. Built in response to the Chevrolet Corvette and influx of import roadsters and touring cars, the Thunderbird represented everything 1950s America was all about, style, power, and innovation. The Corvette made its market debut for 1953 and was a revolution in American sports cars and performance. After seeing the initial success, Ford began developing its answer almost immediately, first making its appearance at the Detroit Auto Show in February of 1954. Production would then begin on October 22, 1954 for a 1955 model. That's pretty much nearly record time from concept to production. The 55 Thunderbird would become that automotive icon and nameplate that would carry itself through 1997 and again from 2002 to 2005. The point of the Thunderbird really wasn't to copy the Corvette, but to create something the Corvette wasn't. The concept of the personal luxury car refers to its intended purpose of comfort rather than raw performance. Thunderbird offered a level of refinement and luxury that was missing from the Corvette. It was specifically advertised as such rather than calling itself a sports car. Corvette was more about performance, acceleration, and dynamism. In fact, Thunderbird could be had in a wide variety of features not found in the Corvette, including power windows, power steering, power brakes, and available power seats. Only the Corvette could be had with sportier bucket seats. 
In its first year, Ford sold 16,155 Thunderbirds, which was way over their initial estimate, beating the Corvette nearly 21 to 1. As far as styling, the T-Bird was Ford's flagship, with many of its unique styling cues making their way to the rest of the lineup over the years, such as the popular Fairlane. The single silhouette runs from the tip of the headlamp to the tail lamp and gives a low slung appearance, lower in the rear, higher in the front. Other signature touches include an egg crate grille, hooded headlamps, and afterburner style tail lamps. Hood and side scoops were also a tasteful touch, but aren't functional. Initially, to keep costs down, the original 1955 was more of a parts bin vehicle than tailored like a 57. Therefore, the standard 292 cubic inch Y-block V8 was Mercury derived. The running gear was from Ford's current station wagon, in addition to full-size tail lamps out back. Other things such as the instruments were also carryover from other models. The chassis is actually a shortened version of the same one found in other larger Ford cars. Changes over the years were minimal, but helped the Thunderbird become more of a well-rounded vehicle. In 1956, more trunk space was added by relocating the spare tire to a Continental kit mounted on the rear bumper. The exhaust was also rerouted for 56 and continued through 57. The 55's exhausts were routed to either side of the license plate. They were enclosed in chrome surrounds and bolted to the bumper to make it look seamless. 56's and 57's are located towards the edges and are fully integrated into the bumper in oval housings. Fender vents up front were then added to improve cabin ventilation. While all Thunderbirds came standard with a fiberglass hardtop or an optional snug fitting soft top, it wasn't until 56 where buyers could opt for glass porthole windows as a no cost option. These became standard for 57 and greatly improved rearward visibility. The overall styling was really massaged over for 57 when the front end received a reshaped bumper with larger grill for better ventilation. Keeping it with the current automotive trends led to enlarged tail fins as well as larger tail lamps. The Continental kit was removed for 57 and the spare was relocated to the redesigned trunk that featured more vertical space. Other minor changes including relocation of the Thunderbird script from the rear to the front fender, new instruments, rayon carpet with color keyed steering wheel, as well as optional four-way power seats with dial o -matic controller. Nineteen fifty-seven was the first year the Thunderbird was offered with fourteen by seven and a half inch chrome wire wheels. The prior year had fifteen-inch wheels wrapped in four-ply bias tires. Of course, this one's fitted with modern two hundred five seventy-five radials. Brakes consist of power hydraulic assist 11 inch drums at each corner, and as far as the suspension, up front is an independent setup with unequal length upper and lower control arms and coil springs, while the rear features transverse semi elliptic leaf springs. The steering is fed through a worm and roller steering gear, and while not as tight as the Corvette, it was more comfortable and smooth with a balance of handling and proper road manners. Overall length is 181.4 inches with a width of 72.8 inches and a height of 49.6 inches riding on a 102 inch wheelbase. Total curb weight was around 3,288 pounds. Now I'm going to pop the hood. For 1957 you had your choice of two standard engines. A 292 cubic inch Y block V8 with a 9.1 to 1 compression ratio or the higher performing 312 cubic inch V8. Several higher performing 312 variants with single and dual four barrel carburetors with upgraded internals, including a rare supercharged mill, were also available. Over the years, the engines also received more power. The overhead valve 292, as we have here, features an iron block with aluminum heads, two valves per cylinder, mechanical valve lifters, and a single dual downdraft Holly carburetor. It produces a respectable 212 horsepower and 297 pound feet of torque for 1957. With the upgraded 245 horsepower 312, 0 to 60 times were 9.9 .9 seconds and quarter mile times of 17.9 seconds at 80.1 miles per hour. The 292 is likely to be in the 11.5 second 0 to 60 range. Top speed is an estimated 115 miles an hour. As far as fuel economy, average ratings were between 12 and 18 miles to a gallon and featured a 20 gallon tank. Inside, the luxury styling of the Thunderbird is ever apparent, with soft vinyl padding across the doors and dash, and complemented by a comfortable vinyl bench seat. The doors are padded entirely with a curved armrest that blends up into the dash. Aluminum trim is also a key styling element. It follows the curves of the armrest and flows into the restyled instrumentation cluster. And taking a closer look at the detailing of the rib pattern across the door, you'll see a lot of the Thunderbird logos found throughout. 
And of course, polished metal bright work is found throughout keeping with the upscale appearance, not to mention standard wind deflectors on each door. The standard seating arrangement for the T-Bird was a manually adjusting vinyl bench seat as buckets were not available. Optional was a four-way power seat with dial matic controller allowing for 35 different adjustments. With these electric seats, like many new cars today, when you remove the key from the ignition, the seat would automatically slide back for easier entry and exit. Like I touched on earlier, Thunderbirds actually came standard with a removable fiberglass hardtop with the portholes for 1957. Optional was a soft top that you could put up in case you ran into a little bit of rain. Otherwise, if you don't have the soft top and when you fold the bench seat up, there's a little bit of a trunk pass-through that allows for more storage to the rear. You do have a little bit of all-weather protection down below with a floor shifter for both manual and automatic equipped cars. The steering wheel had manual telescoping function that allowed for two-inch adjustment either inward or outward. Also cool was Ford's volumatic system attached to the standard town and country AM radio. When you increase the vehicle's speed, it automatically increases the radio's volume, like a typical modern speed compensated volume system. So let's go and see if she sounds. An amazing sound, you can just feel that V8 rocking the vehicle back and forth. I'm going to shut her up. The Thunderbird really is a pure sports car roadster. It's small, just enough room for two people, narrow room coming in here so taller individuals or individuals with thicker thighs might have to slide their leg underneath when they're coming in, but there's plenty of sporty accent in as well. The transmission is nice and crisp, and the V8 is pretty potent, and it was also pretty well loaded for the day. Your aluminum speedometer cluster with your fuel level, tachometer, vehicle temperature, and an analog clock down below with your speedometer right front and center. Your lighting control like you saw earlier, left air vent activation to allow some more fresh air to come in the floorboard, or if you look down below, there's two chrome registers on either side. If you look on the body of the Thunderbird that you probably saw earlier, there's a little side panel right there that'll pop open to allow more direct fresh air to come in more forcefully than just the standard vent mounted up in the engine bay. Down below, it's your chrome accented parking brake, as well as your dimmer switch for your high beams. Your vacuum assist wipers. Standard AM town country radio. Your tune, push button presets, and off. There's also a little light up there to illuminate the controls. Your ashtray is here, lighter, and your heater off to the right. Adjust how hot you want it, whether you want it defrost, and turn on the blower. Beautifully padded dash with your single speaker located up in the middle, vinyl visors, and a standard mirror. Beautifully styled vehicle. Got to shut her down. And we're going to check out the rest of the vehicle, shall we? Like I said, Thunderbirds for 1957 received a redesigned trunk that had more vertical trunk space, so yeah, they were able to take off the kind of awkward continental kit that they had for 1956 and relocate the spare tire back into the trunk without sacrificing too much cargo space.
a modest glove box. The Ford Thunderbird is an icon of automotive design and a great representation of the daring designs that came out of the 1950s. It pioneered a new segment of cars and innovative technologies over the years, an instantly recognizable nameplate that, while not currently in production, is still respected by many. Well everyone, I hope you enjoyed this in-depth look at the 1957 Ford Thunderbird. Be sure to stay tuned next time, there's a lot more where that came from. Take care everybody.